All right, so survey says that brow lift is the topic for today. Thanks for everyone who participated. Next week, I'll do facial fat grafting. But today for Facial Plastics Friday, we're gonna look at brow lifts. And so I'm gonna back this all the way back up to some basic anatomy. When you look at your forehead and your brow, you also have to consider the eye. It's the relationship between the forehead, the brow itself, and the eye that we're considering in a brow lift. And so the first thing I'd look at would be the shape of somebody's eye socket. I've got a little skull here. The eye socket or the orbit really plays an effect on how much eyelid you see. And so somebody like me who has really deep set eyes, the, the plane of the cornea of my eye sits behind the bone of my cheek here. That person is going to have a heavier looking brow like I have. Whereas somebody that has what we call a negative vector eye, where the eye actually sticks out past the plane of the cheek is going to have a more full looking upper eyelid. And the effect of the brow position will not be as extreme on the eyelid because you can already see a lot of eyelid. It doesn't mean that those people don't need brow lifts sometimes, but Someone like me is kind of a sitting duck for having a really low, tired looking brow because I have a deep set eye. So that's number one thing to consider with the brow lift. You know, what does your eye look like in terms of its shape and position and uh, position relative to your cheek? The second thing to consider is the muscles that are around the brow complex. And so there's only one muscle that lifts your brow up and creates these lines here, these horizontal forehead lines, and that's your frontalis muscle. And the frontalis muscle is paired one on each side. Sometimes they interdigitate in the middle. Sometimes they're completely separate. And so that requires, you know, an anatomical assessment when we're doing a brow lift. But this is the only elevator of your brow. It always makes me laugh when people say, you know, I've had Botox or Xeomin or Dysport or something elsewhere. I want you to do the same thing. I just want a brow lift. My injector injected me here. It's impossible to weaken the only muscle that lifts your brow and create a brow lift. It's, if you weaken it, then gravity wins and the depressor muscles win. And the depressor muscles are the orbicularis muscle that goes around your eye. And so on the side, it pulls you down. So when you squint, it's pulling your brow down. And the inner corner here, it pulls it down. And that works with your procerus muscle and your corrugator muscles, which lets you kind of scowl and frown. So you have this complex of brow depressor muscles. You have this single brow elevator muscle, and then you have gravity. And gravity with time is gonna be pulling your brow down. So what do we do for brow lifts? Well, it depends on the shape of the person's eye. It depends on sort of their, their goal and, and what they're trying to achieve. Um, but there are a number of different ways to approach this. The simplest would be a chemical brow lift, and that's using neurotoxin, Botox or Xeomin or, or Dysport, to treat the, de the depressor muscles of the brow. And so if you make the tug of war in favor of your frontalis, you can get a few millimeters of lift of your brow. Now, some people get spocky from that. If they have a really strong frontalis, you can get a spock. Most people won't get that uh, dramatic of a lift, but it is possible. So somebody who's maybe not ready for surgery, wants to try something differently, uh, non-surgical, we can use neurotoxin. We can also use filler. And in the right person, putting a little bit of filler under the tail of the brow will actually lift it out and give it kind of the appearance of it being lifted because you've given it some elevation kind of topographically, and that can create the illusion of a bit of a brow lift. And so that would be the non-surgical approach. Things like profound radio frequency microneedling theoretically could tighten the skin a little bit and get a lift. I've never been really impressed with that, so we don't usually offer that because it almost uniformly disappoints people, but theoretically you could get a little bit of a lift. Combined with Botox, combined with filler, it might work well. Surgically, we have a whole bunch of options. And the names of different brow lifts come from mostly where the incision is. And so a direct brow lift is an incision right across the eyebrow hairs and we remove an ellipse of skin and we directly lift the brow up. The advantage to this is that the vector of pull is in whatever direction you want to, to pull. So maybe you just want to pull the medial part up or the outside part up. Um, you can kind of control that exactly how you want because you're directly lifting the brow and you're hiding the incision along the hairline. This is traditionally used in facial paralysis. Somebody gets a Bell's palsy, they get a paralyzed face and it does not recover and they have a low brow. We directly lift it because it's very powerful to lift the brow up and put it in that position. I'll use it in selective um, cosmetic cases, people that don't want to or can't have a general anesthetic that don't need um, anything wild. We can directly lift the brow if they have a full brow hair, if they have a microbladed or tattooed brow where we can hide the scar easily. The next type of brow lift we have would be a mid forehead lift or indirect lift where you're placing lines in deep creases in the forehead and doing the same thing as a direct brow lift, but using the creases in the forehead to lift the brow up. And again, that's usually for facial paralysis. I don't really use that cosmetically. 
And then we get to the uh, more traditional types of brow lifts. And so a trichophytic brow lift is a hairline incision, it goes right around, we remove a strip of skin and hide the scar at the hairline of the hair and lift the whole brow up. This can be done in concert with a hairline lowering uh, procedure. So if somebody has a very tall forehead, very high forehead, and a high hairline, you can move the hairline down and lift the brow up and accomplish both at the same time or just do one or the other. It doesn't really work very well for somebody with a short forehead because you don't want to shorten their forehead even more and put their hairline close to their brow. So that again is patient specific for that, um, that surgery. That is a traditional brow lift. I don't really know anyone who does trick of, or who does um, bicoronal brow lifts where we cut right across sort of the middle of the scalp and take a strip of hair bearing scalp and lift everything up. But that is a traditional way to do it. And especially in somebody that has a really short forehead if you want to move things back. Most often what I do in my practice would be some sort of variation of a temporal brow lift and endoscopic style brow lift. And that would be making an incision in the hairline going underneath the periosteum or the lining of the bone and releasing all of that periosteum down to the eye socket. That lining on the bone comes down and reflects into the orbit and that's called the arcus marginalis and it's really tight there. So to get a really good natural brow lift, you have to come down, you have to release that fascia and then it allows you to pull the whole brow up. And that's why we do it in the operating room because it's quite invasive and painful and you don't wanna be awake for that. There's also your chewing muscle. If you clench your temporalis muscle that lives here, it has a really thick tendinous insertion to the skin and to the bone and it connects to the periosteum and you have to divide that connection to be able to move the lateral brow wherever you want and have it stay there. If you fight against that, the brows just fall down. So you have to do a full release and lift it up. So through tiny incisions in the hairline, we can make that whole release. We can release the arcus marginalis and then we can lift the brow up and we can tack it or tether it to the fascia of that chewing muscle. And then I use bone tunnels or sonic weld uh, pins to then actually put little anchors into the bone and with sutures, lift the brow up and anchor it to that position that we want. Now this is a, a variation of something called an endotine or the, the um, endoscopic brow lift where we would use something that looked like a dissolvable carpet tack and lift the skin up and hook it onto that tack and keep the brow in position and over time that dissolves and then the brow theoretically is going to then refuse to the bone and stay in the higher position. Those are really bumpy and create contour irregularities, so I don't use them, but the uh, pins that I use are lactic acid, they dissolve away. They let you do the same thing, same concept, lift the brow up, tack it down to a fixated bony point, then allow everything to heal in place. And now the brow will sit at a higher position. And so those are the different ways to uh, attack a brow lift. Uh, there's lots of different options dependent on the person, but essentially we're talking about uh, injectables, direct brow lifts, or endoscopic style brows with bone anchors and temporalis muscle fascia anchoring in our practice and every once in a while a trichophytic type brow lift to lift the brow up and really like a facelift this only works well if you release and then uh, redrape and let things kind of scar in place in a new spot because if you're just tugging on things from far away they tend to drop the skin will stretch and relax and you'll end up having to do uh, revisions uh, so that's the approach to brow lifts in our practice um, <clears throat> It's growing. I'm doing more and more brow lifts. I, I see pe more and more people with cosmetic upper lid concerns and they think they want a blepharoplasty. But if you're heavy out here, the skin underneath your eyebrow, that's not eyelid and a blepharoplasty won't fix that. And a blepharoplasty will fix extra skin on the eyelid. But if you're heavy here, a blepharoplasty with a temporal brow lift will open up the corner of the eye and kind of give you the rejuvenation of your eye uh, that you're looking for. So send us your questions about brow lifts, happy to answer them. That's a quick and dirty uh, approach to kind of how we think about brows and how we think about what to position. The last thing I'll say is we try to avoid lifting the medial brow because if you lift the medial or inside brow, you look shocked, startled, scared, and that's not how people age. People age with those depressor muscles down and in and with gravity. And so brow lifts are usually out and up because that creates more of a rejuvenated open eye rather than a startled look. Everybody have a great weekend and happy Facial Plastics Friday.